When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Major phone carriers make you sign contracts with rigid data plans to trap you into a kind of forced phonogamy. Sounds pretty insecure if you ask me. At Consumer Cellular, we believe in a more consensual and healthy form of phonogamy, free of contracts and more flexible to your data needs. This way, you stick around not because we force you to with contracts and fees, but because you love our phone plans. Like ardently love our phone plans. Phonogamously. Consumer Cellular. When Freedom calls, we're here to answer. Call us at 1-888-FREEDOM. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man that puts the cock in Joe Cocker. He is the captain. Say what? I know. My parents are going to be so disappointed when they hear... <laughs> I'm already not allowed to use my last name on the show. I I think they're going to make me move out of state. Well, it's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. <laughs> thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Tonight, tonight, we are drinking rye by the hardworking men and women at the Terrapin Beer Company, garage grade, three and three quarter bottle caps out of five. This beer is a gold medal winner, so you know it's good. Made with five varieties of hops and a generous amount of specialty malts, rye pale ale offers a complex flavor and aroma that is both aggressive and well-balanced. Mm. And rye was brought to us by these great supporters of the garage. First up, a cheers goes out to Amy in Auckland, New Zealand. Cheers, mate. A big we like a jib to sweary Jen from London. Cheers, mate. And next up, how about a double-fisted cheers to Brandon and Livia out in Seattle. Kinky. Big shout out to Julie from Ontario, Canada. Next, we have Brett sending us a keep up the good work beer followed with a roll tide. Brett is in Jasper, Alabama. And last but not least, a big shout out to Kat Sandra and her best friend, Brooke, loyal garage attendees from Connecticut. Thank you all for helping us out with this week's show. If you want to put a cold one in the captain's hand or in Team Nick's hand, go to truecrimegarage.com and click on the donate button. And if you want us to say roll tide, you better put a $20 bill in there. (laughs) All right, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer, and let's talk some true crime. All right, Captain, where we left off yesterday was with the second autopsy that was performed on Kendrick Johnson's body. His body had been sent to pathologist Dr. William Anderson for this second autopsy that was paid for by the family and supporters of the family and their cause. Mm -hmm. Dr. Anderson's autopsy report directly contradicted the original autopsy findings of an accidental death. Anderson's report stated that there was physical evidence of blunt force trauma to the right neck and soft tissues consistent with inflicted injury. Anderson went on to state that the injury was likely inflicted by someone else and that the death should be investigated as a homicide. So the Johnson submitted the report to the Lowndes County coroner's office, the GBI and the United States department of justice. The family began calling for a coroner's inquest, a process similar to an investigative grand jury, whereby the jury listens to all the evidence and then rules on the cause of death. 
Now, in October of 2013, one thing that we're the the main focus of today's show, Captain. Okay. The main reason why you and I got together tonight in the garage is to drink beer over coldies. Mm-hmm. Is to discuss the questionable items that surround this mysterious death of this young man. Yeah. We we have this is this is a highly debated case. This is a very controversial case. And as you will see today, we're going to try to go through these things line by line, maybe clear the air a little bit on some of them and see what we can find. Yeah, and just so we're clear, so we're all on the same page. The first investigation, the first autopsy, they claim that this is accidental death, that he was going into this mat after shoes, he got stuck in there, he then suffocated, and then we found Kendrick. The second autopsy and the second investigation is kind of saying, hey, that's not what happened. We think that somebody hit him and then rolled him up in one of these mats to cover that up. And not only did the person that attacked Kendrick try to cover this up, but law enforcement and the sheriff and the school and the coroner and everybody was trying to cover this up. Well, and probably the strangest thing for me was this report that came out in October of 2013. This is a report that stems from the second autopsy that they discovered that Kendrick's body that it had been stuffed with newspapers before it was closed up and prepared for burial. Yeah. So Kendrick's internal organs, this this included his brain, heart, lungs and liver. These items were nowhere to be found. Right. And protocol is that the organs are sealed up in a in plastic placed inside the body cavity and disposed of with the body. Right. Now, a GBI spokesperson told CNN that after Kendrick's initial autopsy, the organs were placed in the body. The body was closed up, and then it was sent off to the Harrington Funeral Home. Now, Harrington's owner says that the, the funeral home never received the organs at all. Uh, Harrington states that he was told that the organs had been destroyed by the quote, natural processes, end quote. Right. So decomposition. And that the the organs had been discarded by the person who had opened up the body at the pathologist's office. So this is this is I do want to point out something here. So this is one, this is a very strange thing to hear that the this young man's body, you know, the the organs have gone missing Right. sometime between the first autopsy and the second autopsy, right? Right, starts smelling like a cover-up. So we have, a, we have a couple of issues here, Captain. This is the second time that we are presented with evidence that something has gone missing between t- the transportation of the body from GBI right. to the funeral home. So I think, we, I think we need to really go through this one because th- there's... There's some interesting stuff within this whole statement. So first of all, for those of you panicking and freaking out out there, I guess it's, you know, it's not uncommon that they do in fact stuff the body with something. Right. And from my understanding, I've never witnessed this, hope never to witness it or really hope that I never knew anything about it to begin with, was that typically they use sawdust or cotton, do I have that right? Right. And I guess that it might have been kind of an old practice for funeral homes to stuff a body with newspaper. It's something that has gone fallen out of practice since I don't know, sometime in the seventies, maybe the sixties. Mm. But it, it, but we're not talking about something. It sounds something that's like something that's so incredibly unbelievable, and then we learn that this is actually somewhat of a common thing. The problem here, though which is pointed out to us by the man that conducted the second autopsy is that when we do not have these organs that prevents them from further testing those, those items. Now they did have slides uh, they did, they created different slides and they would x-ray the different organs. So they did have those to make their opinions or their findings of the second autopsy. The other thing though, too, is it, isn't it strange that we've now we've we've had clothing that magically disappeared wow. between the transportation of this young man's body from the GBI to 
the funeral home, and now we have these organs. Because we have GBI stating, no, we, we followed protocol. We put these organs in plastic. We sealed them mm-hmm. up. We put them back in the body. We transported the body to the funeral home. Now, a little background on the funeral home because people, you know, it's, it's looking like these people are very bad people. The funeral home, it's my understanding that they provided the Johnson family with a service, with funeral services for Kendrick at no cost. Right. They, just just they, the cost of the organs. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, that they were... They were trying to do a good thing for the family that had suffered a terrible tragedy. Right. And they wanted to do something good for these people. Now, they mm-hmm. may, here's here's my thought. You know, I, I, I just got done saying how good and how nice they probably were. Is there a chance that they may have cut some corners to right, save some give, costs? Right, because they're giving you a free service. It's very yeah. possible. I mean, first of all, the clothes, let's not put any blame on the uh, GBI because the clothes were were with Kendrick and whoever transported Kendrick messed that up. So no fault of the GBI, no sense of cover up there. There's conflicting stories. The there's one story that the funeral home said, well, we never got the organs. They were not there. They and said I, they never got the clothing as well. Right. But again, it, it's, it's on the report. So then you start wondering where the, if the clothes were misplaced in the transportation, were the organs misplaced? Or was there something where they go, again, I also heard reports that the funeral home said, well, we actually received those, but we discarded them. Now, I've heard both reports. So is it possible? You know, I heard some crazy conspiracy from some pastor saying, well, uh, these young black people are being killed to sell their organs because that black market is so hot. So you're going to tell me that this high school kid was killed in school when there's hundreds of people in the school so you can sell harvest his, the organs. Right. Well, 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 let me, here's the question I would like to pose to that, that pastor. Look, I went to school for computer. I don't know anything right. about, you know, pathology. Here's my guess. The poor young man, whether he was murdered or a tragic accident, he laid in the in a mat upside down for close to 24 hours. Right. You can't use those. You can't harvest those organs and use them for anything, can you? I I, I wouldn't they're not working at this point. Don't don't they try to like like me, I'm a donor. Mm-hmm. So if something were to happen to me, aren't they trying to harvest those organs as fast as possible so that they they are usable for yeah. lack of better term? I don't know the answer. Uh, to that, but I would assume that some organs would be salvageable more so than the other ones, like depending on temperature and some, some probably have to be transferred right away and other ones, maybe not so much. Well, I'm only pointing out captain, the conflicting stories between the GBI and the funeral home for one simple reason. We're looking at each of these items today because there is questions around, did they get this investigation right? Was he murdered? Right. Was there a cover-up? Okay, so a couple couple items with the missing clothing and with the missing, missing organs. We have GBI saying, we sent those items to the funeral home. We have the funeral home saying, we never received them. Right. So what I'm getting at here is if, if GBI is right... If GBI is right in saying that we sent these items to the funeral home, there's no cover up as far as the missing clothing or organs go. Right. Because then that means they got to the funeral home and the funeral home chose to dispose of these items in a different manner than what was expected. And instead they might be passing the buck and saying, I don't think we ever received them. Right. However, so one key thing here, when we talk about cover ups, the funeral home's not going to cover up for GBI. The funeral home's not going to cover up for the sheriff's department or for the people that actually murdered this young man. Mm-hmm. They don't they don't have a stake in the in in the in the claim here. They don't have a they don't have a dog in the fight. They're just people that are trying to do something nice for the Johnson family, something nice for Kendrick and give him proper services and um, I understand that, but the the other thing with the GBI is if they claim that they sent the clothes and they claim that they sent the organs were with him and the organs weren't found on him when they 
when they dug him back up, right? Mm -hmm. Well, then they have reason to cover their own ass. And again, we got another step. So if GBI is telling the truth and the funeral home is telling the truth, the person you need to look at is who was transporting his body. Agreed. And here's where I have an issue with it. Because the organs might be, the organs might be a bigger deal. You know, who knows what evidentiary value the organs could have or the clothing. One could argue one over the other, right? Right. The, the, the issue I have is that in one instance regarding the clothing, we have the transport company saying that we signed for clothing. When we picked up this young man's body, we signed for clothing. Right. You can't sign for organs because according to the GBI, they were inside the body itself. Right. Okay. So now we have the funeral director or the funeral home owner stating we never received the clothing. Right. Right. What, what, how does that work? Why is there, why is there a sign? Why is there a list of what we are picking up and it's signed for when we pick it up? But when we do the drop off to the funeral home, there's no list that, that, that we go over with someone at the funeral home that signs off on that. I'm sure there is. But again, this but then is why just, are we, this is what I get mad about with some of these, um, with some of these potential cover up stories, right? You almost feel like you don't get to hear the entire story because it would only make sense if there's a, if I'm signing for a list of items that I'm picking up you, when I'm delivering to you, you should be signing for the items that I'm dropping off to you. Right. That would, agree. that yeah. would straighten out the whole jazz with the, with the clothing. Again, I, I I'm, I'm guessing that there is some kind of protocol and we don't know, we don't have that evidence. That's why it's as simple as GBI says one thing and the funeral home says a different thing and we don't know what the truth is. The other issue though, too, captain is if in fact GBI disposed of the clothing or the organs or both, mm -hmm. then it's pretty fishy. Then there could be a cover up. Mm -hmm. But at the very least, again, we see protocol not being followed. Right. Definitely. So we talked about the missing organs. We talked about the missing clothing. Well, there's some other, there's some other missing things as well. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the video footage that was from the Lowndes High School. This is the video surveillance system that they have there. Yeah, so just a little bit of this background. So all these cameras or most of these cameras are motion uh, censored. Mm -hmm. So they only turn on when somebody actually enters the room and they stay on as long as there's motion there. What's interesting is if you start diving into the video footage right away is that most of the cameras themselves are not synced up. So for example, you might have Kendrick going down a hall and it says timestamp, you know, let's say 120, but they know that that period would have been like 115 or whatever, right? Then he walks into the gym Jim's camera turns on, but now all of a sudden it's, uh, you know, one thirty, right? Right, and then you go. He just walked through a doorway. Did he hang out in that doorway for fifteen minutes? My point is that their time codes are not synced at all. Yeah. Not only are they not synced with each other, but they're not synced with the actual time. Now, again, if this is true, it's it's. Why would you have this system set up like this? Uh, and why would you have the time codes off? Either way, because of that, there becomes a lot of issues which lean more towards the conspiracy side. Well, and yeah, so there's there's several issues that I have with this. Somebody that's very, fam as someone that's very familiar with these types of systems, right. what I can tell you is that they do... They're, they're set up, they're installed professionally. They are set up professionally. Everything is usually tight as a drum, tip-top shape, ready to rock and roll when these cameras are set up. Over time, there will start to be glitches in the system. Things will get off sync, like you had just said. Things will start to not work properly. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is you have school administrators that are not they're not trained in these areas. They're not trained to fix these things. They're not trained to fix to, to realign everything. So it's working and functioning properly. So again, that it's tight as a drum, ready to rock and roll. That's when a phone call has to be made to those installers, to those software engineers, to people that know how to do this stuff. Right. I have witnessed 
and we've talked about it here on the show as well. You know, uh, hotels, uh, street corners, bars. We've talked about glitches and questions within their surveillance systems that what tends to happen, I think, in these situations is you have a little glitch that either goes unnoticed or it's noticed and it's always thought of, oh, I'll make that call tomorrow. Right. And yeah. then tomorrow turns into next week and the next week turns into next month. And before you know it, you've gone through four months and the timestamp's wrong or right. the timestamps are off. Now, the problem with that, though, is these are, in a sense, they're government officials, aren't they? School administrators, they're yeah. p- paid for by the local taxes. Right. And with the with the expectation that our children are going to be safe mm-hmm. that that during these hours they are at the school and the school is supposed to be a safe place run by people that that are looking out for our children's best interest right so the first problem is gbi goes to the school administrators and they say that we need all video evidence related to kendrick's right. to this incident yeah, that's the first problem I see because I think you should just say, hey, give me all the the video footage you have for the last 48 hours or the last three days. Yeah, so just to jump in here real quick, Captain, it's estimated that there was approximately 1,900 hours of footage that would have been taken from the 36 cameras that should have been recording on January 10th and 11th. So the day that Kendrick... Johnson died, and then the day after, which would have shown portions of the investigation. Right. The problem I have with this is that people claim, or they're suspect to claim, that there's missing footage. And if GBI would have went in and said, give us all the footage, and there was missing footage, well, then the problem lies with the school administrators, right? Mm -hmm. But you didn't do that. So now... All these people suspect that there are gaps in time that nobody can account for. So it makes it look very suspicious of a conspiracy. And you have no way to defend yourself other than saying, well, we we looked at all the footage they gave us. Well, okay, then why is this part missing? Is it coming from your end or is it the administrator's end? There's several, several problems that people bring up regarding this camera footage. The first being that the sheriff's office had released some still images that were taken from the videos themselves. This is portions of the video that showed Kendrick walking into the gym and heading toward the mats. Right. Okay. So the issue being there is there's, there's some concern like we talked about with the timestamps later, what's going to happen. And this was made possible, I believe through CNN who started making open records requests to the school for them to release the actual footage. And then later a judge ordered that some small portions of the surveillance footage be released. Well, when they released that, the the videos that were released, they do not appear to be timestamped. So now people are wondering why does, why did the images coming from the sheriff's office have a timestamp on them that are still images. And now the actual video footage comes out and there's no timestamp on it. Right, and it could be as simple as the fact that we know that that timestamp was not reality, that that timestamp was off, you know, actual time by 15 minutes or whatever. And and that would be a reasonable explanation. Or just have the wrong timestamp on there. Well, Another fishy thing that starts making you think that there's some kind of conspiracy here. Here's the other thing with these security systems. So if you are the sheriff and you're reviewing the security footage with me, the security administrator, let's say in my office, and we're looking at the monitors together, you can take a camera and you can take a picture of that monitor and that monitor may have the timestamp on it. Right. But if somebody gives me a court order and says, Hey, we need you to give us this information. Well, what I'm going to have to do is actually go in to the database and I'm going to have to transfer that information, transfer that surveillance footage to something else, mm-hmm. you know, a, a, a zip drive or something and, and hand it off to them. By the time that I do that, that timestamp may not accompany that actual footage. Right. Because it, it's only going to be transferred in the manner that I tell it to, unless there's certain default settings set up for that, that method of transfer of, of transferring. it. Now, the other thing that people called into question 
is that we have images that seem to jump around. We also, it seems like the cameras that were focused on the mat area in the old gym, that they only captured blurry images. Right. And they don't appear to have videoed anything around the time of Kendrick's death. People speculate stuff like, okay, we see uh, somebody walk into frame, and then all of a sudden the next frame, somebody disappears out of nowhere. Yeah, they appear and, like, and disappear out of nowhere. Which, again, could just be glitches in the system because they're motion-censored systems. And so it might not have picked up the first motion of of that individual, and then all of a sudden they pop up like they're you know, teleporting. Well, CNN took it the extra mile. They, they had filed suit to access the video footage and then they hired a forensic video analysis, uh, analyst, I'm sorry, to analyze the 290 hours of material that were received from all of the cameras. The video footage analysis was this. There was jumpiness present on the video. There was blurriness present. Uh, there were timestamp issues. This is all confirmed by uh, a, a third party that doesn't have a dog in the fight, right? Well, but they are being paid by CNN to do the investigation. So, Well, yeah, paid by CNN to do the investigation. But what I mean by that is their loyalty lies with CNN. It doesn't lie with the GBI or with the Johnson family. Right. It, you know, that's they, they're only beholden to CNN. Now, the analyst states that there was jumpiness, there's blurriness, there's timestamp issues. However, he says that this is all pretty easily explainable. Um, you can explain it by erratic motion sensors, unfocused or outdated lenses on the cameras. Right, or uh, dirty lenses. The analyst also said that the non-sequential footage, mm -hmm. this is the footage where it will appear that people are appearing or disappearing out of nowhere is the result of lost information and or corrupted files. Now, whether the data was corrupted just via system malfunction or processing error, or whether it was the result of deliberate tampering mm -hmm. could not be determined. So the analyst is saying this is occurring on the video footage. Right. However, I cannot, in my expert opinion, tell you why it occurred. It could have just been some kind of glitch or error or it could have been a person going in there and manipulating the file. Correct. Which, again, either way, it starts making you think, well, hey, this is somebody covering their tracks. Now, where it gets weird, though, is you have to remember, people could be covering their tracks just because they did a shitty job of the initial investigation. So if you're covering up the shitty initial investigation, that doesn't mean you're covering up a murder. Yeah. Well, of more concern was this. The the analyst, he determined that at least an hour was missing. There was there was missing footage that, that would make up about an hour. This is coming a from- a long time. Well, it seems like a long time, but- It is a long time. Well- I don't think I don't necessarily think we're actually talking about a real hour as you and I know an hour. Okay, they're not talking about a consecutive time. Right. They so, they're not clear on this statement. What they're stating is that there is at least an hour missing from the video footage from all four cameras around the gym. So, meaning that what I believe this to mean and I could be wrong. They're not outwardly stating one way or the other. Mm -hmm. I believe this to mean that collectively when we take all four of these cameras, when we collected all that information together, that adds up to about an hour of missing footage. Well, but that could also be like the one camera where you see Kendrick walk in. Mm -hmm. The camera doesn't start back up for another 15 minutes because there's nobody in frame. Right. So could they be talking about 15 minutes? And if you times, time? if you times that by four, that gives you your hour. Oh, good job. So furthermore, the analyst told investigators that they needed to subpoena the actual surveillance servers in order to determine where the missing footage went, as opposed to just relying on what was given to them by the school and quote, those files are not original files. They're not something investigators should rely on for the truth of the video. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. 
But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapist at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. At Consumer Cellular, you get the same exact coverage as the largest carriers, but for up to half the cost. Same thing, up to half the cost. Up to half the cost for the same thing. 50% the money for 100% the same thing. I hope I'm making myself clear. Consumer Cellular. When freedom calls, we're here to answer. Call us at 1-888-FREEDOM. Half the cost savings based on cost of Consumer Cellular single-line 5 gigabyte data plan with unlimited talk and text compared to lowest cost single-line postpaid unlimited talk text and data plan offered by T-Mobile and Verizon May 2023. Angie's List is now Angie, and we've heard a lot of theories about why. I thought it was an eco-move. Fewer words, less paper. No, it was so you could say it faster. No, it's to be more iconic. Must be a tech thing. But those aren't quite right. It's because now you can compare upfront prices, book a service instantly, and even get your project handled from start to finish. Sounds easy. It is. And it makes us so much more than just a list. Get started at Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I. Or download the app today. All right, we're back. Cheers. Man. Welcome Ladies. back and cheers. Captain, you had a few items on your laundry list that you wanted to speak about. Well, if we don't talk about them, I think people will bring them up. So let's talk about the blood that was found. It wasn't found that far from where Kendrick was found. It was in about six droplets of blood that was on a wall. It's very dark. It looks almost like black smudge, right? Mm-hmm. Now, they did collect this and they did test it and it wasn't Kendrick's blood. Now, that's fine, and it probably was left there. I believe it probably was. A lot of people on the side that say it's such a conspiracy say, hey, blood is not just left on walls in high school, like we talked about before. High schools are just not that clean. And if this is in the area that they would have put the mats up in, it's possibility that when they put the mats up, a janitor couldn't get to this and clean it. So you have that evidence you have that sample so you can at least find out who that that belongs to and that might take a lot of work and time but you could do that to rule that out and cover your own ass the other piece of item is this hoodie that people bring up all the time it's i think it's a structure hoodie well before we move on to the hoodie i think you know what the, the biggest part of the argument for the blood evidence that's found approximately 50 feet from the mat that that Kendrick was later found in is that, you know, just because you rule out that it's Kendrick's blood does not mean that it doesn't have anything to do with this situation. I right. mean, it could be the offender's blood. Right. How many times have we talked about an attack that goes down and the offender injures themselves or the person there that they are attacking defends themselves and injures the offender. So I think that's the big concern there that it's not just, Okay, well, thanks for letting us know that it's not Kendrick's blood. However, we would like to know who it belongs to. Right. Especially, I think where you run into the trouble here with a lot of this investigation, and I think specifically with the blood evidence, is that most of the people at this school, they're minors. They're not not adults. Mm -hmm. And that makes it a little trickier when you're talking about the privacy of these children they're children Mm -hmm. you know and i think that's that's where they ran into some issues regarding the surveillance footage too because the school's like well look we can't just willy-nilly release all this surveillance footage it's camera it's camera footage of children walking around right you know whose identities need to remain anonymous that that we can't need to be it's their job to protect them right and so there in fact i think with the the blood we we're looking at pretty much the same problem. So that's why they're like, you know what? Well, let's at least rule out Kendrick. Right. 
uh, to put this in the right direction. Where I take, where I have a problem with this, is that there were some people, some some people that were named as suspects. Right. Now, in their defense, they were only named by Kendrick's parents. They were never named by by law enforcement officials. But these persons, I would have loved to have seen the opportunity for somebody to say, look, we're going to test this blood. We'd like to compare it to yours. Right. You have the opportunity here to come forward and say and, and prove to us that this is not your blood. I One potential problem, though, Captain, is it, you, the way that you've described the, the blood that was found there. Mm -hmm. It sounds like this is a, a, a poor sample. Probably, um, probably. It, possibly contaminated, but I guess it was strong enough to, to determine that it was not Kendrick's. Right. So, so yeah, I think that's all an issue. And, and you wanted to move on to the sweatshirt. We mentioned that one of the, amongst the other items that were found at the scene, we already explained away the textbook and the folder that right. was located. Those were Kendrick's. There was a sweatshirt, a hooded, um, a hooded Hollister brand sweatshirt that was found at the scene again again i think they should have tagged and bagged they didn't but they did give back this hoodie supposedly to kendrick's family so they're the ones that are saying or they're the ones that came out and said hey we don't think this was accidental death we think somebody um hit him or murdered him and then put him in the the mat and then and then put the mat back up they're the ones saying that, so you do have that piece of evidence. So if you want anything done to that shirt, I'm going to then put that on you. Again, like I said, they should have tagged and bagged it and kept it in evidence. They didn't, but they did give it back to the family. That's my thoughts on that piece of evidence. Well, and I think before we move too far away from the surveillance footage that we, that we discussed, it sounds to me like that there was an opportunity for the Johnsons to view this surveillance footage right. at the school within days of the death. And they didn't do that for whatever reason. And actually I believe that they were encouraged through, I don't know if it was their attorneys, but there we had already mentioned the NAACP, the uh, SCLC, right. those groups at the very least, we're encouraging them to go and view that footage. And for whatever reason, they did not at that time. But I, I think we should push on forward, Captain, because in 2014, things are going to start to heat up a bit. This is when the Johnsons and their attorneys are becoming increasingly aggressive in their pursuit of justice. They had even gone so far as to mention by name the two boys who they declared had a reason to hurt Kendrick. Right. This is Brian and Brandon Bell. So it's not only these are brothers, Brian and Brandon Bell. The Johnsons alleged that the Bell brothers had used an unnamed female to lure Kendrick into the old gym where they had killed him and stuffed his body into the mat. They further claimed that the crime had been a cover up with the aid of the Bell brother brother's father. Right. Because he was a FBI agent. Yes. That's not, like when you start reading about this case and you hear that, you go, what, what FBI agent, all of these allegations were laid out in a lawsuit filed by the Johnsons against more than 30 defendants that claim were complicit mm -hmm. separately in July, 2014, they sued the school system and the superintendent for the wrongful death of their son. The lawsuit alleged that a white student had a history of provoking and attacking Kendrick at school. Now, yeah, I believe that they got into some kind of fight, and I don't know what that fight was. One of the Bell brothers and Kendrick, supposedly they were somewhat friends. Now this is what the Bell family says, uh, but the Johnson family says, we, we don't know him, never heard of him. They weren't friends. The first issue I have with this is Lord him, Lord Kendrick in the old gym by using a female decoy, right? Mm -hmm. My first problem with that is we do know that he had weight training class and that's the reason why he was in the gym, right? 
Yeah, and they don't back that up with saying, hey, we see a young female going into the gym before he does. Right. So that's just my first problem with this. Yeah. Well, okay, so let's talk about that incident that that you had mentioned between one of the Bell brothers and Kendrick. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when this first comes out, Captain, it's Kenneth and Jackie. They're claiming, you know, Kendrick's parents are claiming that the Bell boys... This whole thing stemmed from an incident that had took place between Kendrick and Brian Bell. That this had occurred, this incident occurred just before Kendrick had died. Mm-hmm. There are people that looked into this. And what the the result of their investigations are this. That that incident, there was an incident. Okay. But, but in fact, it actually took place 18 months earlier. This would be in 2011 when the two boys were freshman members of the Vikings football team. Okay, so picture this. they It's after a football game. They're riding home mm-hmm. on the bus. Okay? And what the report states is that Brian and Kendrick were in some kind of – they're trading mama jokes. You know, your mama's so fat, that, right, that right. kind of thing. Don't get Your mama's so fat when she sits around the house, she really sits around the house. Yeah, so they're trading these mama jokes, and for whatever reason, it gets out of hand, and the two ended up getting in a fight. Yeah, one was better than the other uh, at mama jokes. Yeah, what it comes down to. Yeah. Well, but we've we've been in school. We've seen where these things start off as some kind of friendly tug of war, let's say, and it does turn into a fight. Yeah, and they just had a football game, so you got adrenaline going, and they're probably just coming down from that adrenaline high. They're actually on the bus with with an older team from the same school, from the Vikings football team. Right. Uh, I think it's the varsity team, maybe the JV. I don't know. So we have two teams on this on this bus. They're heading home. This fight breaks out between Brian and Kendrick regarding these mother jokes. So what ends up happening is the boys are separated very quickly once this fight breaks out. When the school bus arrived back at the school. Brian is then with his brother because his brother played football as well. He, he was a junior. He was on the older team. Right. All right. So the two bell brothers, they go home. They're picked up by their parents. The complaint is regarding Kendrick is this, that Kendrick was sent home in the school resource officer's car. Mm. So what, what you have here, and this is according to Kendrick's father, Kenneth, that the white kids get to go home with their parents, but the black kid was put in a police cruiser. Yeah, which is bull round round shit, you know. Well, is it, they should be treated the same. Exactly. Right. If 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 putting if putting Kendrick in a police cruiser and taking him home is a form of punishment, then Brian Bell should have been escorted home by the police officer as well and told what had happened, what had occurred on the bus. Correct. But if your son is taken back to your house and a quote unquote, pretty much a police cruiser, then you should probably remember when this happened and you should probably not say that it happened just before, um, you know, your son was found dead and that it happened 18 months beforehand. Well, therein lies a big problem with this story. So when you initially hear the story and the way that, Kenneth Johnson tells the story. It sounds like there's a fight shortly before his son is killed. Right. And his son not only was in a fight with the, one of the people we think killed him, but the result was my son was punished and the white kid was not punished. Right. The truth of the matter that we end up learning once you, once you dig through, once you dig nothing that, that, that Johnson says is completely wrong. Mm-hmm. Kendrick absolutely was driven home by the the school's resource officer. But let's keep in mind that's that's a police officer that's working at the school. It's not like they called the police right. and a cruiser came in and picked up Kendrick and took him home. Mm-hmm. The way that this story works is it's exactly like I started off with. This is an old fight. This was not a fight that started right before Kendrick ended up dead in the match. Mm-hmm. This was almost 18 months beforehand. And then what we do learn is that, yes, the, the Bell brothers did go home with their parents. Kendrick didn't go home with his parents because his parents were not at the school to pick him up. 
Right. When he arrived back at the school, he has no ride home. The school resource officer that was already there, who would later tell the media, I considered myself to be a family friend of the of the Johnson family. Right. So, so I so, took him home. Right. I knew Kendrick. I knew Kendrick outside of my job of being a resource officer at the actual high school. Just offered him a ride home. It was not a form of punishment. I was just trying to help them out. Right. Yeah, but again, sometimes people only see what they want to see. Mm-hmm. And it or, seems like that happens a lot w- with uh, Mr. Johnson. Well, I, I don't even think it's see what you want to see. I mean, it might be see what you want to see, but could it also be tell what you want to tell? Right. I mean, because... When, Control your narrative. Yeah. Right. When we hear the story from him, it's a, it, it sounds very damning. Mm-hmm. And then when you really start digging through it, you're like, well, it's not a complete lie, but there's things in here that just, that they have different meaning than the way that he describes them. And it's not as simple as the white kid was not punished and the black kid was. Right. So these Bell brothers, I mean, I think the thing initially that jumped out at me when they say, hey, we got these kids that we think might be responsible for possibly hitting Kendrick and then rolling them up up in a mat and you go, okay, well these mats are mainly used for wrestling and one of the bell brothers is a wrestler. So that seems a little fishy, but that doesn't mean anything. Okay. So uh, let's go through these, these bell boys together here. Okay. Well, and they're brothers, but they're also bros. Well, you know? but the, so the sheriff investigated them and he determined that Brandon bell was not even on school grounds at the time that Kendrick had died. Right. So he's on a school athletic outing with the wrestling team. Um, Mm -hmm. This is 25 people on the wrestling team. He's one of them. And that he, he couldn't have been involved because they were out of town for some kind of wrestling tournament that day. Okay. So he's not even at the school. The other bell brother was in a, fourth period class and had like 20 some eyewitnesses placing them in the class. I believe the whole time, right? They're both accounted for in different locations, making it seemingly impossible that either of them, let alone both of them could be involved. This is where the sheriff points out that the boys were never considered suspects because of these reasons. Now they were pretty much cleared right away. Yeah. But the Johnsons would continue to maintain that the bells were involved in, in Kendrick's murder. Right. Uh, they even produced a and made a, a public video raising questions about both of the Bell boys. And they also pointed out that the Bells had refused to cooperate with police. And they pointed out what appeared to be a school record showing that the wrestling bus had not left the campus until 4 p.m. on January 10th. This giving Brandon plenty of time to kill Kendrick and still make it to the bus. Right. So then we have the school's attorney comes out and counters that statement stating that he points to the school bus travel log. Okay. Uh That John Johnson's legal team was referring to. This is just a trip request that was filled out weeks before the tournament to reserve the bus. So they've not, they may not actually know exactly what time they need the bus yet. It's so many weeks in advance. Right. So actually on January 10th, this is what they could prove that the wrestling team had a uh, school's first lunch session, which lasted from 1132 AM to 1202 PM. Then the team and the coaches boarded a school bus and left for a 150 mile drive to the tournament. Mm. The rustling coach's cell phone records indicate the team was in Cordell, Georgia at 1:53 PM. Cordell is approximately 85 miles North of the school, indicating that the bus would have already have left and been on the road at the time that Kendrick was last seen alive on that video footage. Right. So again, Mr. Johnson doesn't want to listen to the actual evidence. I mean, look, is it wrong for you to suspect that something happened for to your son? No. And was there definitely some shoddy police work? Yes. 
but these two individuals that you think have something to do with your son and possibly from rumors, because if you look at a lot of the police investigating, um, the police reports and when they're talking to students, now they're talking to some of these students seven months later, there was some rumors about this. Well, when the parents of a dead child is saying, hey, we think these kids had something to do with it. You better believe in that high school. There's going to be rumors started. So we have these rumors started, but then they come back to you. Law enforcement comes back to you and says, hey, we have their whereabouts. We have their alibis. That's where it gets really fishy to me, though, or, or fishy from the Johnson side to me, is they go, well, okay, so these guys have alibis. So now not only are the Bell brothers responsible, but the superintendent's responsible and the and the the whole school's responsible and the sheriff's responsible. And they're all covering that up because the Bell brothers, their father is an FBI agent. Mm-hmm. It just seems really, really far-fetched. Well, it's stretching it. So I, th- I think... I think with that, Captain, we can kind of lead into, that leads us into what are our thoughts? What are our conclusions after reviewing the evidence? I'll let you go first, my man. Oh, man. I don't even know where to start. Because there is a lot of this stuff that it does bother me. Uh, Do I think the investigation would have been handled a little different if it was one of the Bell brothers that was found in the mat? I do believe that. I believe that 100%. I don't think they would have been walking around just in their shoes. I think they would have collected all pieces of, of evidence. I think they would have crossed their T's and dotted their I's. And uh, I think they would have acted like a bunch of pieces of shit. But I think what happened here was they had to see their son. And because the way he died, and I lean more towards accidental, that the way he died... And the way he, his face looked afterwards. I think that was all the proof that Johnson needed to think that something, you know, bad happened and it wasn't just an accident. That somebody made his face look that way. That his face had to be beaten up and it wasn't just because he was basically upside down and also dead for probably what 12 hours before he's found Mm -hmm. and I think him looking at his son was enough for him to go down this wild goose chase now where it makes it weirder is that because the investigation didn't cross their T's didn't dot their I's didn't bag and tag everything that they were supposed to didn't wear coverings for their shoes didn't talk to students beforehand and I think assumed right when they found him right when they found Kendrick Johnson that this was an accident and they didn't do all the things that they should have done and then when the Johnsons are calling them out and saying hey we think there's foul play here that everybody that was involved in the investigation is covering their ass not because it was a murder but because they did such a shitty job and so you know, if you would have done your job correctly at the beginning, we wouldn't have all these problems and we wouldn't have all this conspiracy and wasting a bunch of people's time. Well, or would we? That's what that's what I question because here's here's where I stand on this. On the surface, and you know, I, I'm going to say that I I go into every one of our cases right down the middle. And I'm going to look at it and I'm going to let the evidence lead me where it should lead me into, into the right mm-hmm. direction with this one. I did not because I'd already had some previous knowledge. Well, I thought I had previous knowledge about this case right? because on the surface, it does look very wrong. It looks like there's a lot of wrongdoing by a lot of people and that there was in fact a cover up. It's very fishy. Yeah. When you start to get a better understanding of the layout of the old gym and the the setup of the mats mm-hmm. and things like that, it starts to look to you, or to me anyway, like it was, there's a chance that this was an accident. Right. Once you hear how this this was described, that this is, was set up, that the that, that children would often place things inside of these mats for safekeeping. It becomes 
it becomes apparent to me that we might have just an accidental, strange, bizarre death. And you talked about it. You nailed it. It's, it's when, when the parents saw their son, they couldn't come to the same conclusion that was already decided for them. And I get that. I get that. It had to have been the worst thing for them to see their son in that manner. Now, where the public becomes involved is that uh, the picture is released of Kendrick after death that was taken by his father. We don't know the exact point that he took this picture. And, but what we do know is it was either taken on that Sunday when he went to identify the body or it was taken after the autopsy. Right. Okay. Regardless, the reason why he, his appearance, why he appeared that way was because the amount of time that had gone by, by the, by the injuries, by the state of the body, by being upside down and potentially the autopsy having been conducted. So where the public had a, had an outcry for let's open up this case again. It's because we're reacting to that photo. Yeah. And that photo is not fair to the public to simply release it and let the public believe the public believed when they saw this, this was a picture. This is what he looked like right when they found him. That's not the case, man. Well, but that's when you see his face and then you see his actual picture, you go, this is a face of a man that was, you know, vicious viciously beaten right that's what that's what it looks like that's what your eyes tell you it is and and for some people it's as simple as seeing is believing and that's just it but but there's enough science to explain the reason that he appeared that way right okay now i so we're kind of taking unpopular uh an unpopular stance on this i believe i i think that most people look at this case and i think that there's still possibly a huge public outcry that this is an injustice that occurred. Um, I Here's the thing. It's not without question, though. I can't look at this and go 100% this was an, this was an accident. And why? Because of things that you pointed out. Because of it being a shoddy investigation. Because protocol was not followed. Mm-hmm. Because there is some surveillance footage missing. Yes. You know, those questions are not answered. But if I had to pick a side, I think this is just a tragic accidental death. And I think the tipping point for me, what really kind of pushed me towards that conclusion was there was an outstanding um, woman and her name is Lee touched him. Okay. So in 2015, she was an investigator with the NAACP. Mm -hmm. She gave an interview to media publication regarding Kendrick's case. Touchton investigated Kendrick's death for two years, first in her role with the NAACP and then as an independent investigator working for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Touchton was a seasoned civil rights activist whose role required her to investigate claims of racially motivated civil rights violations. She had lobbied the DOJ to investigate the case, and she repeatedly contacted the U S attorney's office with the same request touched and conducted a thorough probe into Kendrick's death after the sheriff's office had closed their investigation. She interviewed numerous local public officials, including the County school superintendent, the attorney for the sheriff, the sheriff, and one of his deputies. She talked to school board members and obtained Kendrick's case file. She even toured the crime lab several times interviewed the director, visited the body cooler refrigeration unit, and looked at the alarms and record books. She noted that contrary to Kendrick's father's statement and claims that the crime lab cooler was not working, that it was warm air, she saw the alarm that would go off if electricity was shut off or if temperatures got too high or too low and confirmed that there were backup generators in such a case as a blackout. Right. She noted that the chief forensic investigator is black. He's an African American. Right. She spoke with the school's attorney and gained an understanding of the lapses in the surveillance footage. She toured the old gym and was given a reenactment of how Kendrick was found. Touchton's conclusions was that there was no credible evidence to even claim a murder had been committed. Kendrick's death had been a tragic accident. She said, I think the murder theory is not only false, 
but also ridiculous and based only on wild speculation and outright fabrications. Based on the preponderance of medical evidence, the diagnosis of positional asphyxia Mm. is the only diagnosis that fits all of the facts. There is no way that the accused boys could have been involved in Kendrick's death. In fact, she resigned in protest from the NAACP because she noted that the organization continued to provide assistance and funding to the Johnson parents who were making allegations against the bells that she said were lies. Well, good for her. After her resignation from the NAACP, she teamed up with Reverend Floyd Rose of the SCLC. He had been requested by the family to look into Kendrick's death and was one of the biggest supporters early on in the quest to find justice for Kendrick touched in and Rose investigated the case together and came again, came to the same conclusion that Kendrick's death was an accident. Reverend Rose, who is an African American man told the USA today, you won't find a person of any reputation in this town who says that boy was murdered. Are there other injustices around here? You bet there are, but this is not one of them. And I'm not going to be bossed around by whites or blacks. He told Grantland, which is a sports blog owned by ESPN, that he simply could not believe that the sheriff, the detectives, the forensic scientist, the criminal investigators, the investigators from the GBI and the medical examiner had all colluded and risked their careers to cover something up. He went on to state maybe in 1951, but not in 2013. So I got a couple words for some people in this case, if if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. So first of all, the sheriff, there's this video footage of some news reporter that go in and they want to talk to him about the Kendrick Johnson case. And he says, I'm not talking about that case. And they say, why aren't you talking about this case? He says, Because I don't want to. Well, first of all, this individual, which did a pretty shoddy job, I believe, you should be thankful that you worked on this case, that you made errors and blunders, and that possibly that you could learn from this and learn that these blunders and these missteps that you took, and instead of following the letter of the land, You followed your own protocol and then look how much hurt that caused the Johnson family and then the Johnson family bringing up that possibly there's a conspiracy and then how much hurt that brought everybody else. And so you should be one, just take it in and say, yes, I made a bunch of mistakes. I wish I didn't make, but I'm going to be a better sheriff and a better, better individual because I worked on this Kendrick Johnson case. Well, and I pointed out that the, my tipping point for me was the final conclusion by Lee Touchton and then by Reverend Floyd Rose. And the reason why that was the tipping point for me was because just like me, they went into this case thinking that there was an injustice here, thinking that there was a murder and that there was a cover up. These two intelligent individuals spent a lot of time. They spent two years investigating this only to end up at the other end of this, right? That there was not an injustice, that this was in fact an accident. So where I can't say 100% that I believe this was an accident because of protocol being broken, because of things that are missing, because things that have not been explained fully, I'm going to rely on these two smart individuals that spent two years on this investigation and they didn't work for anybody that was involved in the cover up. And they went into this expecting to find a cover up. Mm-hmm. And it only turned out that they ended up at the other end of it. Yeah. And when I went into this, I mean, I love a good conspiracy as much as anybody else. Right. I think they're fascinating cases. Mm-hmm. I just don't see the evidence of that. And I'd be willing to hear the evidence. I think there's enough reasonable doubt to go, Hey, if you can give me, some solid piece of evidence to show me that this was actually a murder and not an accident, uh, I'd be willing to listen. I just don't see that evidence out there. (music) 
And make sure you go to the iTunes store. It's been requested a bunch of times. I took 20 of the themes. I'm going to be taking all the themes. Theme music. Theme music of the shows and putting them together in these compilations. And you can get the first volume uh, of the themes on iTunes for pre-order right now. And before we wrap up, Captain, something I haven't done in a few weeks, a little recommended reading. Yeah, I thought I, I just figured you were so into computer that you didn't like books anymore. Well, I actually had a few people email me saying, hey, there's been no recommended reading for the last few weeks. And that, in fact, has been true. But if you've noticed, we've recommended movies, mm-hmm. podcasts, um, a bunch of other things. And what I, I, I typically don't like to recommend too many things in one show, so... Uh, We're back at it this week, and this week we are recommending a book called The Undercover Edge. This is by Derek Lavassier. He's a former detective and TV personality. Uh, If you could see his face, you would know he's on the, I believe, the ID channel. He Mm -hmm. has some kind of uh, new new case that he's covering with another gentleman on there. He was also uh, on some OJ documentary. He was at CrimeCon last year. I'm recommending this book because he will be at CrimeCon along with us again this year, which is in May of this year in Nashville. Yeah, he'll be the second sexiest man at CrimeCon. Well, the uh, so this is called The Undercover Edge, and it's one of these motivational, uh, inspirational books. It's, it's teachings that you can use in your life. Um, so you can find your hidden strength. So you can find your hidden strengths Learn to adapt and build the confidence to win life's game. You can check that out by going to our website, truecrimegarage.com. Click on the recommended page. We have a bunch of books there for you. All right. We'll see you guys next week. Uh, Be good. Be kind. And don't litter. The Angie's List You Know and Trust is now Angie, and we're so much more than just a list. We still connect you with top local pros and show you ratings and reviews, but now we also let you compare upfront prices on hundreds of projects and book a service instantly. We can even handle the rest of your project from start to finish. So remember, Angie's List is now Angie, and we're here to get your job done right. Get started at Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I, or download the app today.